Hello. Right, so today we're going to talk about one of the cranial nerves. That is one of the peripheral nerves that come out of the brainstem in this case. We're going to talk about the spinal accessory nerve. Hang on, why are you calling it spinal accessory nerve if it's a cranial nerve and it's coming out of the brainstem? Yeah, so we're going to look at the spinal accessory nerve, why it gets called the spinal accessory nerve. Is it a cranial nerve? And our main focus will be where it forms, where it runs, and the structures that it supplies. And then the injuries, uh, if it's injured, uh, what problems does that cause? I'm not gonna talk about the nuclei that this nerve comes from. I'll leave that for the neuroscientists. But we have the pons here and the medulla in the brain stem, and we can see the olive on either side. And posterior to the olive, we see a number of little tiny rootlets coming out of the medulla oblongata. And these rootlets here are, were, <sighs> considered the cranial part of the accessory nerve. If we follow the medulla oblongata inferiorly, it becomes the spinal cord. And in the upper, well, in, yeah, in the upper cervical segments of the spinal cord, we see a whole bunch of rootlets forming. Now, this is where the spinal nerves come out of, but we also see a whole bunch of little rootlets coming out of the spinal parts of the, sorry, out of the cervical parts of the spinal cord, which come together and they ascend up back towards the level of the olive. And those parts come together and form a nerve which is called the spinal part of the accessory nerve, or what we now call the spinal accessory nerve. If you follow those little rootlets, the cranial part of the accessory nerve from posterior to the olive, if you follow them and see where they go, they go off and they, they run and they blend with the vagus nerve and they innervate the muscles of the, the palate and the pharynx. But if you've studied the palate and the pharynx, or if you've studied the vagus nerve, you might be thinking, hang on, the vagus nerve innervates the muscles of the palate and the pharynx, or certainly most of them. And that's the contemporary understanding and that's how it's described in the textbooks. So we now say, ish, we now say that the cranial part of the accessory nerve is part of the vagus nerve and innervates those structures. Still with me? So those rootlets that are coming out of the spinal cord at the cervical levels, the levels in the neck and ascending, that form the spinal part of the accessory nerve. That's the structure we talk about when we talk about the accessory nerve. And whilst we normally say the, the spinal part of the accessory nerve or the spinal accessory nerve, as is probably written in most textbooks these days, often the spinal bit gets dropped. We just say the accessory nerve, also known as cranial nerve 11. There has been a little bit more research and our understanding of the cranial part of the accessory nerve, whether or not it's part of the vagus nerve, the nuclei that it comes from, the roles that it does, is probably not yet complete. But I describe the cranial part and spinal part of the accessory nerve to avoid confusion. Because if you read around, you will read different things, and now you know what they're talking about. So we are going to focus on the spinal accessory nerve and its path and what have you. So what does the spinal accessory nerve do? Oh, no, it does that. It does, it, that's what it does, All right? Shrug your shoulders and twist. So it innervates the sternocleidomastoid muscle and it innervates trapezius. Sternocleidomastoid muscle runs from the mastoid process down to the the sternum and the clavicle down here, hence sternocleidomastoid. So if you activate, if you contract one muscle, it essentially brings your ear closer to your sternum. So it does that. And the upper fibers of trapezius shrug your shoulders. And that's how you will test the function of the accessory nerve. You can ask a patient to perform this action and you can ask somebody to do it against resistance and likewise you can ask them to turn their head against resistance. And if you go and do this yourself in front of a mirror, you may well see your sternocleidomastoid muscles start to poke out. So you get used to looking at the muscle masses of the sternocleidomastoid muscles 
and trapezius. And in somebody that has an accessory nerve injury, you'll find weakness and you might see some atrophy of the muscles there. Um, and um, in fact, the trapezius muscle is this large triangular muscle of the back here, put them both together, you've got a trapezium shape. Um, it has upper fibres, middle fibres and lower fibres, and it's attaching to the scapula. So it moves the scapula and um, it also then stabilises the scapula, holds the scapula against the thoracic wall. And the scapula is crucial for the movements of our upper limbs. So if scapula, if the stability of the scapula is impaired, it can seriously affect movements of the upper limb. So if somebody's accessory nerve is damaged, you have problems moving your upper limb. And as well as that. Anyway, so where does it run? How might it be damaged? Well, as I said, so the rulers begin in the spinal cord and they come together and they ascend alongside the spinal cord and they go back into the cranial cavity. So if we look at the base of the skull, we see this big hole here. This is foramen magnum, literally big hole. Um, so if you read tables in textbooks, you might get confused and read that the spinal accessory nerve leaves the skull by passing through foramen magnum and the jugular foramen. That's, that's not what the table means. It passes through both foramina, but it passes into the skull through foramen magnum. And then this ugly hole here This is the jugular foramen. So the jugular foramen um, is a big ugly hole because it, this is where the internal jugular vein forms. We have the, uh, the inferior petrosal sinus and the sigmoid sinus draining blood from the cranial cavity. They meet here, drain into the internal jugular vein and the internal carotid artery is also nearby. But through the jugular foramen pass, the internal jugular vein and cranial nerves 9, 10 and 11. That is the glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus nerve and the spinal accessory nerve. So that's how it leaves the skull. It enters through foramen magnum and it leaves through the jugular foramen. Now, when it leaves, it's with those major blood vessels. So it runs with the internal carotid artery for a little way and then it jumps off. And if this is the mastoid process, you can see how then the spinal accessory nerve doesn't have far to go to get to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and that's what it that's what it does Whee! so there's the mastoid process here's the sternocleidomastoid muscle and oh, <laughs> uh, where's the uh, uh, <laughs> there's there's the accessory nerve there. So we've got a number of deep structures of the face here. The spinal accessory nerve follows the internal carotid artery. Maybe it's with the internal jugular vein. I think it's a little bit variable. And then it jumps out, penetrates the sternocleidomastoid muscle and innervates it. And then it's often described as appearing about, so we were looking at the posterior triangle the other week. Um, the posterior triangle is, is here. It's just this region described in the neck. And we find the spinal accessory nerve appearing within the floor of the posterior triangle. Sometimes it's described as about halfway along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is kind of what we're seeing here. Well, I think sometimes it's described as about a third of the way along. But there then, that's what we're seeing there. There's the spinal accessory nerve in the floor of the posterior triangle, we can see it after it's gone through the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and then it disappears again because it's disappearing deep to trapezius, and it's on the inferior surface of the muscle there. So it will then continue down and innovate, it gives the motor innovation to the trapezius muscle. Um, I think the sensory innovation from the trapezius muscle, you know, proprioception, stretch receptors and that sort of thing, is conveyed by cervical spinal nerves. So the motor innervation to the trapezius muscle, this muscle back here, and this muscle that you can palpate here is by the spinal accessory nerve. So in that respect, it's a very simple cranial nerve.
the spinal accessory nerve. Innervates sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. And that's its path. So it's most vulnerable in the, in the floor of the posterior triangle of the neck. Um, I mean, it can be damaged by a penetrating injury, but it's also at risk um, during surgery. So um, uh, surgeons tell me that when they're doing a neck dissection to remove a tumor, sometimes they're doing a neck dissection to remove uh, lymph nodes within the neck, um, they look for the spinal accessory nerve so they can try and preserve it and keep it safe. Um, but sometimes that's not always possible. So the spinal accessory nerve can be injured, sometimes unavoidably, uh, by surgery uh, in the posterior triangle of the neck. If you've been watching my vlogs, um, you'll see that during lockdown I've been um, a little bit more um, um, consistent with my strength training. And one of the movements I do in strength training, because I look after my shoulders, because I'm a climber and a swimmer and that sort of thing, is a, an overhead press of some sort. And a dumbbell overhead press is a good example of the movement that I'm talking about that you need trapezius for. You, um, the scapula here, the glenoid fossa faces that away. And if you don't move your scapula, you can raise your arm this high, but you need to rotate your scapula that away to be able to raise your arm above your head. You can palpate this yourself or you can palpate it on somebody else. But if I, if I raise my arm, if I, so if I keep my scapula in position, that's as high as I can get it. So if I want to raise my arm above my head, I have to rotate the scapula so that the glenoid fossa points upwards. So the dumbbell overhead press exercises the upper fibers of trapezius because they pull on the scapula and let you raise, the, raise, your, raise your arm, raise your hand above your head. So if the spinal accessory nerve is injured, um, sure, there might be um, problems moving the upper limb generally, but the biggest complaint is likely to be I can't, I can't brush my hair, I can't scratch the top of my head because it will be difficult or nearly impossible or impossible to get your hand above your head. You know, there are various cheat moves you can do, right? But, um, so it's an important nerve. The upper limb is important to us. This is a cranial nerve, but it's a cranial nerve that affects the upper limb. I've labored on too much, but it is important. Anyway, okay, right, stop talking, Sam. Gee, God, blimey, right, see you next week.